Good morning. It's great to be here today. Uh, I'm going to talk about Indiana's water shortage plan. Um, it includes some drought triggers, and that'll be the main focus of the talk. And I'll also talk a little bit about the water shortage plan in general, and just a little bit about the water resources of Indiana. Well, the drought of 1988 uh, caught the attention of our state legislators um, in part because of some irrigation issues with large-scale agricultural operations and some associated domestic water well failures. Um, so in uh, 1991, the General Assembly enacted House Bill 1260 and charged the Department of Natural Resources to formulate a water shortage plan. And that was completed in 1994 with uh, input from a uh, a lot of different stakeholders and the public. Uh, the water, 1994 water shortage plan uh, contains a wealth of information about droughts and water resources and what to do uh, during a water shortage, but it didn't have uh, a body to enact the water shortage plan. So. Uh, Oh, Senator Road Act number 369, um, it was enacted in oh, 2006 as uh, Indiana Code 1425-14, uh, the Water Shortage Task Force. They were charged with uh, enacting the Water Shortage Plan. You, you, you don't have to be right next to you. Okay. Uh, enacting the Water Shortage Plan and also to update the 1994 Water Shortage Plan. Uh, I was listed in the outline as a member of the Water Shortage Task Force. I'm not a member of the Water Shortage Task Force. In the code, the governor uh, appointed 10 individuals to, uh, I don't know, I can use this one. <laughs> the governor appointed a, we can hear you anyway. Okay, so. okay. The governor appointed 10 individuals. Uh, as outlined in the Indiana Code, uh, one person each from public water supply utilities, uh, agriculture, steam electric generating utilities, uh, industrial users, um, one from an academic expert in aquatic habitat and hydrology, uh, one from municipalities, and one each from the environmentalists, consumer advocates, economic development advocates, and the public. Um, uh, the Water Shortage Task Force completed their work over about the course of three years or so. Um, all of the information is on the Water Shortage Plan website, all the meeting summaries, uh, several presentations, uh, the Water Shortage Plan itself. Um, I I was the DNR representative for the drought triggers work group. Uh, so we worked with uh, Dr. Dev Neogi, our Indiana state climatologist, uh, to come up with an appropriate drought trigger index. Um, so Dr. Neogi and uh, one of his students, Jam um came up with a review of drought triggers for the water shortage task force. and. Also, some research comparing the Palmer uh, drought indexes, which were used in the 1994 plan. They compared it with the standardized precipitation index to see how well each performed during past Indiana droughts. And that information, it's included in the plan and uh, it's listed on a poster next door, too. Uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about Indiana water resources. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, all of uh, Division of Water's uh, publications are available free on the internet for viewing and printing and downloading. Um, right above the Wisconsin Glacial Line, um, oh, this occurred about 20,000 years ago, the last glacial maximum in Indiana. Uh, above that Wisconsin glacial limit line, uh, we're generally uh, rich in water resources. And below the glacial line, 
um, water resources are restricted, uh, well, surface water and um, the major aquifers along the major river valleys and also some bedrock aquifers in places. Uh, this is a map showing groundwater availability for Indiana, and it kind of illustrates the richness of Indiana's water resources above the Wisconsin limit glacial line. Uh, the map is color-coded um, in uh, gallons per minute yield, for example, for groundwater. Uh, the pink color here, um, Typically, that would refer to a yield of less than 10 gallons per minute with uh, some dry holes likely. Um, so below the glacial limit line, um, unconsolidated deposits, sand and gravel aquifers, they're largely restricted to the major river valleys. Uh, even though they're below the glacial line, that tremendous runoff from the melting glaciers transported uh, uh, an abundance of sand and gravel that was deposited in the major river valleys, even the Ohio River here in places. Um, so that's the, the main source of uh, groundwater for in southern Indiana. Now, the water shortage plan has four different stages, um, normal, watch, warning, and emergency and three different drought triggers. The one month standardized precipitation index, the US drought monitor, and stream flow as a, a percentage of normal uh, monthly mean stream flow. The drought triggers, it, uh, it takes more than one of the drought triggers to be activated to for a water shortage um, stage. So for example, uh, at least two of the drought triggers have to be activated to move the water shortage stage uh, below normal. The water shortage identification regions used in the water shortage plan are the nine climate regions as designated by the National Weather Service. Uh, Indiana is fortunate to uh, have uh, oh, abundant precipitation, about 40 inches annual precipitation, and it's spread out fairly evenly over the four distinct seasons of winter, spring, summer, and fall. Um, there's about 390 cooperative precipitation stations in Indiana, but only about 70, well, less than 20% of those report in what we would call real time. Uh, the other stations are, report their data a lot less timely. Um, that was one concern that the water shortage task force had was with uh, the number and the, the location of the reporting precipitation stations. Um, Dr. Neogi um, explained to the task force and myself help us understand that the drought indexes are uh, all going to be using the same precipitation. So Indiana just needed to choose the drought index that worked uh, for the state. Uh, there's 28 stream flow gauging sites that the water shortage task force recommended for uh, average monthly stream flow. Um, Indiana streams are perennial for the most part. Groundwater is an abundant component of surface flow. Uh, there's just a couple of exceptions here. The St. Mary's River at Decatur, it's, with, it's within a glacial lake plain. Um, and the Muscatatuck River uh, in southern Indiana uh, flows over shallow bedrock for the most part, so it can be somewhat of a flashy stream. Um, this is showing uh, conditions before the onset of the 2010 drought in Indiana. It's from our NRCS friends. Someone mentioned uh, PRISM data and their GIS person used the PRISM data to put this together. But it shows uh, 
a pretty wet spring and early summer for the most part in Indiana. Uh, down in southern Indiana, there were places where there's some oh, departure from average uh, precipitation. And that turns out it's a kind of provision of things to come. And mentioned the drought monitor quite a bit already. Uh, Dr. Neogi is one of the advisors to on the U.S. drought monitor. And oh, the map from August 3rd, 2010 kind of reflects that cumul cumulative departure from precipitation where um, abnormally dry conditions are creeping into southern Indiana. Uh, we compute the standardized precipitation index for the climate regions in Indiana, the Department of Natural Resources going back to 1895. Um, we said that the one month standardized precipitation index was one of the drought triggers for Indiana. And for August 2010, it's showing oh, severely dry conditions are within southern Indiana and within most of the state and even the two counties that are within the normal range, uh, three and six, uh, they have negative numbers. Um, so they talked about the SPI yesterday, how it's um, computed, it's normalized so that the mean is zero. So negative numbers indicate more dryness and positive numbers, uh, moist conditions. So even uh, three and six there have uh, negative numbers for the one month SPI. And here's the drought monitor for the period ending August 31st, 2010. Um, the states under mostly abnormally dry conditions with some oh, moderate drought in southern Oh, central and portions of northern Indiana, and then severe drought creeping into the southern part of the state. I'm going to take a look at stream flow for a second of the 28 stream flow gauges within the plan. Um, for August 2010, even though the drought, two other drought triggers are showing dry conditions. Um, Indiana streams, for the most part, uh, above 25% normal stream flow is normal, considered normal. So only the flashy Muscatatuck River is the only stream that's uh, below the drought trigger level of 25%. Uh, we'll take a look at more of the dry conditions in a minute, but even for November of 2010, several months later with below normal stream flow, um, most of the streams uh, haven't reached the drought trigger limit. Um, one of the exceptions is the St. Mary's River at Decatur. It had been about at 15% for the last two months and then the gauge malfunction in November because of the dry conditions. Uh, this is another slide from our NRCS friends showing uh, we saw the wet conditions preceding the drought, and they made up another slide to show the dry conditions overall from August through October 2010. Um, so most of the area is showing uh, significantly below normal precipitation, uh, and even the, oh, the wetter areas are, are showing two to three inches below uh, normal precipitation. Uh, summer of 2010, the drought monitor for the period ending September 28th uh, shows the drought conditions. Um, severe drought is within a large portion of southern Indiana. And we'll take a look at the, oh, the one month SPI for September 2010 to see how that oh, compares with the drought monitor here. And it's showing very dry conditions in southern Indiana and even for climate region nine, it's almost in the oh, severely dry category. 
uh, with a SPI value of minus 1.42, so it's very nearly in that severely dry category. Uh, so now two of the three drought triggers are activated and the water shortage plan kicks in and uh, for some appropriate response. In the water shortage plan, there's um, oh, a response that targets a significant water withdrawal facilities. In Indiana, that's um, oh, a pump that oh, can pump over 100,000 gallons per day or over 70 gallons per minute. Uh, so a letter was sent out, we have about oh, 1,400 surface intakes registered in the program and about 6,300 wells. So a letter was sent out to um, those facilities within um, the drought monitor, the severe drought warning, those counties uh, with the SPI, that's one of the limitations that we have with it is that it's at the climatic region scale and not at the county scale. So we use the U.S. Drought Monitor as the area to, to show where um, the letters would be sent out to the affected counties. Uh, oh, this is the letter here. Um, one of the th things that was included with it, uh, we asked for this water shortage stage, they asked the facilities to cut back their current water use by 10 to 15 percent, and it's a voluntary cutback. Uh, the Water Shortage Task Force didn't want to mandate uh, that they had to cut back. Uh, it just depended on uh, the facility, what their water supply situation was. And one of the things that they were really proud of was this uh, model ordinance that they came up with. Uh, so they gave them some support here. They, this is listed on the website too, but we put it in here. They can download that model draft ordinance. And if they need to cut back, they can modify it and cut back to where they think they should. So it provides a level of this letter will provide a little level of support for their customers if they start complaining because they have to cut back on water use um, without the state itself mandating that they have to cut back. The Department of Environmental Management uh, also sent out a letter to uh, water suppliers, public water supply uh, utilities. Um, and a lot of these are smaller purveyors of water like restaurants, uh, gas stations, convenience stores, uh, churches, and the like. Um, and they also sent a letter, or oh, a survey questionnaire asking them if they're having any water supply issues and or asking them if, uh, if the drought continues, do they anticipate any water supply issues. So these letters came in pretty handy because we got calls. Some of them didn't know what their water supply situation was, so uh, it kind of forced them to become aware of their situation. Um, taking a look at the one-month SPI for October 2010, uh, all of the state is within the moderately dry category for the one month SPI. Um, you can see the, the three month there looks rather drastic. I didn't put, include the drop monitor from later in October 2010. Um, but it was somewhat in between the one and three month uh, SPI and drought intensity. And we take a look at the November 2010 SPI and see that the whole state is now in relief. Um, we have almost all positive values for the SPI. Uh, so rainfall fell in November of 2010. And taking a look at stream flow. Uh, most of the streams in Indiana for November 2010 were above the 25% of normal uh, mean stream flow for November. 
uh, just a few streams up in the northern part of the state. Um, we're in the drier category. For the, well, we just saw for the one month November SPI and stream flow for November 2010, the dry conditions were relieved. Uh, Mark mentioned when the drought monitor comes out. Uh, so the rainfall occurred after November 23rd, 2010, fell near the end of November. Um, so if you can kind of keep this in mind, we'll take a look at the drought monitor posted the following week. And what a difference a week makes. Um, oh, rain fell the last week in November on Thanksgiving, November 25th. Uh, about one to four inches of rain fell across Indiana with uh, luckily the heavier amounts fell in southern Indiana where it needed it the most. Um, David told me that um, during La Nina conditions, uh, the Great Lakes states typically have a moist winter, so we were expecting some relief to come, but it came at a great time. Um, and the data here, thanks to the Indiana State Climate Office for specific data here, Ken Charinga does a tremendous job with the Indiana State Climate Office with their monthly summaries. So in conclusion, um, the drought triggers were tested during the dry conditions uh, during the late summer and fall of 2010 in Indiana. Uh, the one month SPI in the U.S. drought monitor proved to be fairly uh, reliable sources of uh, drought triggers um, with the groundwater fed stream flow temporarily lagging behind the, the indicators. But again, it was only a four-month drought, although uh, temperatures were above average for uh, eight consecutive months from March through October 2010, so it kind of accentuated the drought effect. Um, every, a lot of information is listed on the website, and uh, if I can help you out, let me know, and I'll be uh, pleased to take any questions or comments. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. We are encroaching upon our break time, but I would like to give uh, a chance to ask questions. Uh, I'll just make a quick comment. If you are interested in following up with what Jerry is saying, uh, tomorrow and day after, there is a Indiana Centric Climate Services Workshop uh, that is in Indianapolis. That would be great uh, because in Indiana, like other Midwestern states, the frontal systems come through and like Mark was showing about Texas and in some regions, uh, some counties may not be affected that much by it. The, the fire warnings would come on for a county and then they'd get some rain, then they would cancel their uh, fire warning. Uh, so, yeah, the county scale and sub-county scale, that would be great to have the SPI at that level. Any other questions for Jared before we break? Yes? Have you heard any complaints along those lines, like the restrictions were put in place that were based on the whole climate division, but some of the counties in the upper part of the division are in very good shape, and like Jared was saying, the counties are you were saying, in the southern part are not in good shape. Does that, does anyone balk at how this system uh, no, because we went ahead and uh, went uh, used the drought monitor for the camp for the as far as sending out the letters. Um, so no, for the most part, um, they would get confused a little bit about voluntary, like some would think it was they had to do it, uh, but kind of the language there that was really the only complaint that we heard about anything. I think we're here to complain to the business manager. Yeah. Uh, I think we haven't got the test in that for a long time. We wait for a good draft. Okay. Uh,
with that, let's go ahead and break. We have a 20-minute break. Come back here about 5 after 11 or so. And uh, 